Well, first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Assistant U.S. Attorney uh, Tom Perez, uh, U.S. Attorney for New Mexico Ken Gonzalez, and their team uh, for the opportunity to speak on behalf of the city of Albuquerque today. Albuquerque police today released lapel camera video of a deadly police shooting. All right, just keep me safe. All right, don't worry about safety. I'm not a fucking murderer. All right, try to harm you. Try to harm you. Get on the ground! Get on the ground now! Get on the ground! Get on the ground! And I want to begin by stating that I believe all parties here today share a set of common goals to protect and serve our community, to keep our police officers safe. And to foster community outcomes that build trust between those we serve and our police department. Keep moving. Don't hurt me. His hands are still, still armed. Yep. Move. Get your hands out. Get drop your hands the knife. Up. Back. Right behind you. Put your hands out to your side and drop the knife. Hands out to your side. Bean bag. Bean bag. Drop the knife. Drop the knife. I believe in our police officers, and I believe in our department, and our community should as well. Drop the knife! Still got the knife to Dog on him. Negative effect. Still got dog on him. Uh, I can do him on him. Yeah, I don't want that knife in his head. I also believe that community outcomes and community trust in our department is vital. We should always look for improvements in how we serve, and we should continue to maintain a candid dialogue between all stakeholders in this process. All right, he's good. Somebody step on that right hand real hard. He's got a knife in each hand. Knife in each hand. Knife in each hand. Rex, low. I got left. Good on I'm going to switch you. My name is David Correa, and I'm an Associate Professor of American Studies at the University of New Mexico. This lecture series is part of a class I taught in the spring semester of 2015 called Police Violence and Social Control. During the course of the semester, we had a series of guest lectures, and we turned all of those into a public lecture series. Each of those guest lectures were facilitated by one of the students in the class, and those students put together a documentary based on that public lecture series. So why am I interested in violence? Well, that comes from personal and family experience. Um, it's actually why I decided to go to graduate school in the first place, to try to explain some of the, to try to explain the structure of violence that Native people have to contend with, um, particularly through the lens of sort of settler colonialism, which is part of the reason why I wrote that piece and how I framed it for Indian Country Today that some of the students in here read. Um, I've had relatives who've been murdered in border towns that border the Navajo Nation. Um, I'm most familiar with Holbrook and Winslow because my family is from the White Cone area. I don't know if you guys are familiar. Some of you guys know. Um, so what got me political was when I was in high school, the process of white flight be uh, began, white kind of capital flight. The white population began leaving town as the demographics started to shift. So there was this, in short, kind of a, a giant racist backlash that was the background to my high school experience. Um, that kind of set me on a course of wanting to understand racism in particular. My grandfather, he was in public health, wrote um, his master's dissertation on outward migration from the reservations, but also access to social services and healthcare. And so that was in the 
1965 that he wrote that. He was confronting the problems back then. And so I thought it was fascinating that the things that he was talking about and, and sort of, and it's not just the encounter with law enforcement, but also the encounter with, or the lack of, of social services, healthcare, uh, education in border towns really, really points to a structural problem and not necessarily these instantiations or instances of overt sort of um, explicit forms of racism. What got me involved is I'm from Gallup, New Mexico, which is a predominantly native town. Um, so I grew up, you know, learning about my culture, my history, and um, just what, you know, native people have gone through throughout colonization and um, what we're still going through today in regards of colonization. Um, you know, the effects of poverty, which kind of fuels most violence on the reservation, um, also views, or it also fuels a lot of, you know, the problems, the economic problems, which in turn lead to alcohol abuse, um, substance abuse. Um, so that's what really got me involved. So we know that the police violence and police brutality really supersedes at all levels. Also last year during the Trans Remembrance Week, we, we hosted, or we did a uh, Trans Day of, of Visibility or a Day of Action on November 18th, where we took, we protested in front of the UNM library and we demanded for change. We demanded for dignity as well as just that trans lives matter. Now that happens yearly now on November 18th, so look out for November 18th. Um, Disability Rights New Mexico is the state's protection and advocacy system and has been so since 1979. Protection and advocacy systems, um, you know, are nationwide. Every state and territory in the country has one. My name is Jennifer Danette Dale. Um, I am a colleague of uh, Professor Correa. I am a historian by training. Uh, I am Navajo, originally from the Navajo Nation, and still um, live in my community of Tohatchee, New Mexico. Um, my interest in this topic, uh, I'm kind of kind of difficult to say exactly where my interest um, starts and begins and ends and everything because as a Navajo person, um, I live on the Navajo Nation and I've always had to, like my parents, like my grandparents, like my great-grandparents, and like my great-great-grandparents have had to travel into border towns like Gallup, New Mexico, which is the closest border town to my community of Tohatchee, for just the basic necessities. Well, let me start by saying that uh, it wasn't so much that I was interested in police violence. I just had known about police violence for a long period of time before I even was on the uh, city council. Uh, Rito Canales was murdered uh, in 1994 and uh, framed with having stolen some dynamite from one of the uh, excavation places down in the South Valley. As Ken and I and Mike have said, Mike Gomez, as we have said numerous times, we are members of a club that doesn't want any new members. And we've been trying for the last four years to make sure that what happened to our sons doesn't happen to anybody else. And that's who I am. That's why I'm here. Thank you. Thank you. I've always been interested in human rights. I can't tell you exactly why. The interest was just there. Um, Till I was 17 or so, I believed that our government told us the truth. And then Vietnam exploded. Um, so I lost that faith. You know, I, have, uh, I moved here from Arizona after they killed my son. And I actually have uh, five grandsons that live in this city right now. And... Uh, so I guess my tenacity comes from the love of them young boys and not wanting them to be victimized like their uncle was. Uh, well, again, my name is Peter Simonson. I'm the executive director for the ACLU here in New Mexico. Um, we're a nationwide organization, of course, but we are the state affiliate, so um, we take care of all the sort of civil rights issues and civil liberties issues that occur here in the state. Well, you know, when I was a kid, I'd see a police officer drive through my neighborhood and 
I'd always respected them. Like I sort of you know, looked up to them. So I always wanted to be part of them. Didn't want to be state police. Didn't want to be Berlin County Sheriff's Department. I wanted to be APD. So that was the only place that I wanted to apply for. And that's the only, that's the only time I wanted to be a police officer was as, as an elder police officer. If you've lived here in Albuquerque for any period of time, um, this police department has gone through roughly three different cycles of violence, of escalated violence, uh, officer-involved shootings over about the last 40 years. And um, the city council, um, the mayor, have all made sort of cosmetic changes in our laws and oversight mechanisms to try and address that. Um, all unsuccessfully. This is the first opportunity that we have where a federal, federal agency has stepped in to try and correct things. Um, and it's an opportunity that won't come around again probably in any of our lifetimes. So we need to take, in my opinion, as much advantage, capitalize on that opportunity as much as possible. And so I'll, my comments will all go to that, I expect. You know, 75% of natives live in metropolitan cities, such as here in Albuquerque, over 300 tribes are located here in Albuquerque and you know these are the natives who are not being talked about and we really you know want want to bring these to the table bring them out in the open and you know confront these problems because nobody talks about it the land bases that indigenous people do retain right under occupation by the United States the, the towns that border those most immediately are what I've been thinking of in my mind as border towns. So Albuquerque is a border town, right? Because Albuquerque is almost entirely surrounded by indigenous land. I don't know, I don't know if Pueblo land is trust land, that's not my specialty, but what we might call indigenous or trust land, right? Land that is protected exclusively for um, indigenous nations to practice you know, their sovereign status as indigenous nations. Because we often don't think of spaces like Albuquerque as being indigenous spaces. We look around and like the physical infrastructure of the landscape does not say this is indigenous land. Um, if we look at the social institutions in place, such as um, the police, for example, the criminal element of native people living on the street is the, the so-called like drunk Indian, right? And thus creating or manufacturing a crisis that needs to be policed. Um, this criminal element that's out there, it's, it's, they're, they're out there violating property laws, um, they, they need to be arrested or contained or um, their identity needs to be destroyed, which happens a lot. A lot of times um, interactions between police and not just native people, native homeless people, but homeless people in general, which I learned last night, um, is that the police will often take, confiscate their ID or destroy it on the spot. When I was with my first training officer, we, I worked in downtown Africa and he, we had a homeless person sleeping in front of business. That was a call. We went there, and he said, I'm going to let you handle this call. I said, OK. He goes, uh, go ahead and uh, tell us, get this guy moving. I said, OK. So I went, sir, sir, can you wake up? You can't sleep here. You need to move on your way. And he goes, and he watched this for a few minutes, and then he's like, black. And he goes, let me show you guys the guy. So he put, he, put, he put his foot over the, the homeless person's ankle. And he held the, his PR-24, which is a nightstick, like he would a golf club. And he swung it as hard as he could hit this homeless person at the bottom of his foot. Needless to say, this homeless person stood straight up, you know, sheer pain. And he said, that's the way you wake up the homeless. Uh, wow. What did I get myself into? So if you've been paying attention to Albuquerque, what's been going on in Albuquerque, you will know that there has been very much a very public protest against um, police violence, um, um, uh, in a great amount of violence and aggression used against citizens. Okay? Um, what doesn't get told as a part of that is first that um, the aggression and hostility against um, homeless people here in Albuquerque is is really great. And then what gets lost out of that is how many of the homeless who are native peoples who um, whose stories and whose experiences don't are just very much invisible. Okay. And if native homeless people's experiences are invisible, even more invisible than that are the uh, are homeless um, native and Navajo women and um, native and Navajo LGBTQ on the streets of Albuquerque. 
at times our biological family rejects us. We get kicked out of our homes when we come out. Um, we don't get hired. We don't get um, access to health care. There's many things that happen to us. So through that rejection, we find this unconditional love for each other and we call each other family. Now, our relationships grow from that place, but there is this understanding that we all have faced a level of discrimination for being who we are and for trying to live our lives authentically. So I feel like when we're pitted against each other with good versus bad, we look at um, colonial structures, we look at racism, we look at uh, heterosexual privilege, we look at the patriarchy, because all of these inform good versus bad, especially if good is white and bad is brown, that in itself is a, a problem. Sure. My take on that is criminals are not born, they're made, uh, are our society makes them because we're thrown into prisons and now we're labeled we're, we're labeled felons or whatnot. Well, it would be helpful if we at least admitted uh, that we live in a racist country. Because uh, until we do that, I think we're just talking around the edges. The fact that right now, 86%, I believe, of people that are incarcerated are people of color. And I refuse to believe that when born, 86% of those folks say, you know what, I'm going to choose a life of crime. Police brutality, I think it's probably been presented in this class, stretches back decades. It's, it's been an issue that the people in Albuquerque have been fighting for a long time, and not just the people in Albuquerque, but all around the country. Um, when we got here in 2010, there was a number of killings, police killings, um, a spike in police killings. The police killings here have a particular character. Um, most of the victims are young Latino men. Most of the shooting officers are white men. So there's a racist and, uh, overtone. Um, uh, also, uh, a group of people that uh, suffer disproportionately from police violence and, and killing are people who have mental health issues. So in 2011, I believe it was reported that 40% of all the people that um, the police killed had mental health issues. The truth is, and the fact is, and it has never came out yet, is that the officer that shot my son was a, was a negative discharge. The officer did not mean to kill my son. But the police department wouldn't let, him, wouldn't let the officer be forthright with what happened. They, they automatically went there and their internal affairs unit um, went there and orchestrated a cover-up and, and started, started the process to, uh, you know, um, you know, to uh, def make my son look like a criminal and a bad guy and a car thief and this and that. I mean, uh, the, the deformation of character was just uh, appalling to me that they would do that to a, a Purple Heart recipient of the, of the you know, of the war. Yeah, there's, there's a, a large concern because the excessive use of force allegations were not only about general, you know, in terms of how many people have been shot and shot and killed in this city uh, since 2010, but the fact that a, a, a majority of them have been people with mental illness. Mm -hmm. They ended up shooting my son three times in the back at point-blank range. While he's laying on the ground face down. Four years later, it's still tough. Yeah. Um, the first two shots almost certainly incapacitated him. It's highly unlikely he was resisting anymore after that, but they still felt it necessary to shoot one more fatal shot into him. And for the last four years, we've been struggling for justice. And so with the help of a lot of People, a lot of people I recognize in the room here today, a lot of people who have come to our assistance and our aid, we, we've, been, we've been able to, to do what I thought was almost impossible four years ago. There was a city truck going down the street, and I motioned the city truck, I said, block that guy. So he pulls in front of the guy, and the guy comes up to the truck, stops, reaches, looks in the back of the bed, and picks up a big steel pipe, and runs around the truck and starts heading between two houses. 
So I, I pursued him in between the two houses, at which time he stopped and turned on me. And so I immediately pulled my gun out, and uh, he started advancing on me. I said, drop the pipe, drop the pipe. He wouldn't drop the pipe. I, at this point, I don't know what I was thinking. I thought, I've been on almost 20 years. My goal wasn't to kill anyone. I, I made a choice to holster my gun, which was the officer, because he was behind me, saw. And I pulled out my mace, and I hit him in the face, and he was coming near to me. And it worked. He dropped the pipe. Grabbing him, put him on the ground, and handcuffed him. And uh, as soon as we were handcuffed him, the other officer says, Why didn't you shoot him? I said, Because I wanted to see if I could do, you know, do something else. And to... He goes, You should have shot him. You had every reason to shoot him. You should have shot him. I said, I didn't want to shoot him. Okay? And I let go of that. Did the ordinance address the problems? I think the first thing I have to say about that is that. No police oversight ordinance will ever really address the problems. The real issue on whether oversight works is not what's in the ordinance. It's whether the people in charge of the police, including the police chain of command, are committed to doing things right. So who's going to take up the helm? You know, who's going to do the next, um, the next leg of the struggle, the next struggles of anti-compliance? You know, so it's not one person that can do this. When we went to that panel and we presented what we're presenting to you, a couple of people, Navajo men, said, "Well, you know, you guys need to do this. You need to take up the the helm here with the leadership." And it's not something that one person can do. You know, it's got to be a community that says, "You know, I've had enough." Of Shit. You know, and I actually have had enough of this shit. <laughs> if you can't eat, if you can't pay your bills, if you don't have a place to lay your head, then what kind of life are you living? So, as Renee says, she's not supposed to be here. Our trans and gender non conforming community are not supposed to be here. So, when our family does make it through and they make it out of prison and they graduate, we need to give them jobs. We need to do whatever we can to make sure that our trans and gender non-conforming community have the quality of life that we all deserve. And it's called basic human rights. The protests that have happened in Albuquerque really demonstrate the power of the people um, and actually making substantial changes. Now, however that plays out in the court system or the settlement is another story. But at the end of the day, I think it demonstrates that people can and should um, think of alternative ways of engaging these issues, specifically border town violence. So when I got to the answer office, my immediate thought was, you know, we need more natives here. We need more natives in the office, sharing our experiences and fighting forward for, you know, true liberation. And um, so we, we got involved with a few other native activists and I believe it was like five or six of us who, you know, started meeting at a pizza joint and um, really started talking about these issues and bringing them to the table and wanting to do something about it. You know, it's just a matter of accountability and holding our, holding our um, executive branch uh, accountable to the judicial branch. So we need to, each and every one of us got to do our part to make this right or else uh, if we don't, then... Uh, you know, our kids and grandkids will suffer for our lack of uh, involvement. And so, as far as I can tell, because this is a structural and a systemic issue, right, having, going to the institution for recourse, going through the law, going through policy change is an important tactic of the larger movement, but what we really need is a movement. We need an anti-colonial indigenous movement, and we're all, all three of us are actually working on this right now in places like Albuquerque and Gallup. We need people on the streets, um, we've already, we've actually been told by some congressional officials, I'm talking about the U.S. Congress, that they pay attention when people hit the streets in places like Albuquerque and Gallup, because that means that that's what the community wants. So they do actually pay attention. They may be terrified, and I don't care, that's fine. Because what we're trying to do is we're trying to make demands to get the situation to change. Many NGOs provide very important services and do important things and play a, 
an important role in filling the gap in services that certain communities have, but they're not uh, organizations that are going to lead a revolutionary struggle or a radical struggle. Um, for that, you need an independent political formation. Um, so that's kind of what we attempt to build, is an organization of workers and students who um, find a way in their, in their life to um, build in time and a way to be active. The only way anything is going to change is if the policies are enforced and the police officers are held accountable. And that lack of accountability has been severely lacking for the last 10, 15, maybe 20 or more years. There were standard operating procedures, SOPs, police department SOPs, that were in effect at the time Ken's son was shot and that were in effect at the time my son was shot. If the officers who went to my house three years ago had simply followed the established SOPs, my son would still be alive. Um, the other thing that's of concern, though, is our position in our amicus brief and in our motion to intervene is that the, the, the way the settlement agreement is written, it's as trying to make cops better mental health professionals. And we thought, think that's, like, wrong. That, that what since the city is a party to a lawsuit, any money they spend on mental health professionals, we believe, should not be mental health people who walk around with police officers. That they should not be part of the police department, but the, the city should be developing a mental health service system and use those dollars to begin really creating a system of care in Albuquerque. I don't, I, I'd like to see a, a day where the organization we're trying to form now is where police officers who want to step forward, the few good ones that are out there, where they have a solid place to land, where they have someone to talk to, where they have other officers who've been through what they they can empathize with what they've been through. With, with people, with people who understand with what they're going through, and that's what we're working towards making an organization that's nationwide where you can turn to and call, even if you're active. Active is very difficult. If you're active, that'd be very good. What you think. We could do a lot worse. I mean, we do have a police chief that is making an effort to reform the police department. You look at it like a situation like New Orleans, where they are also under a consent decree with uh, the Department of Justice. They have kicked, kicked and fought and screamed um, over the last three years, and they are still trying to get a consent decree with that, with that uh, department. Um, and we're at least not facing that kind of resistance. Uh, I think the key question with Chief Eden, and I say this with all respect to him, is whether he has the leadership to move the department um, towards a, a, a comprehensive reform process. As much as we don't like the fact that uh, civilian oversight can't impose discipline, that it's the police chief that does, um, once you start allowing more than one person to start imposing discipline, you make the job impossible. What you need is to have the people of the city make sure that their officials are held accountable for the way they deal with and discipline and supervise the police. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it would be a hopeless situation if we went down the road of, if there's nothing we can do, then we may as well give up. Uh, I don't believe that. I believe that there's a lot of hard work to be done, but we just gotta do it. The community is ready to do it. It just needs folks to essentially either lead or get the hell out of the way. And I've committed myself to that. Now, can one person alone do it? Probably not. Can two or three or four do it? More than likely not. Five, we start getting a preponderance of folks. Six, we start talking about real power. Seven, eight, and nine, in this situation, we now have essentially a dialogue going. And the dialogue should be very direct with the community that those people are serving.